Thank you very much for your interest. Thanks for joining us. Um, we are, um, as I've said, uh, we are going to give you an introduction to Apache Flink and also some demo and later on some hands-on. And um, I hope you, we hope you will enjoy it. So a little bit about us first. And then, by the way, yeah, Volk is not here anymore, but it was a really nice uh, talk, I think, to uh, get an idea about uh, when to use um, what program and to reason about um, when we really have big data and when we need Flink or Hadoop or just maybe MATLAB. Um, so a little bit about us. Um, my name is Max and with me is Ufuk. Hey. And, we are <laughs> and we are both Apache Flink committers. Actually, we are not the only committers that are in this room right now. So um, if you're a Apache Flink committer, please stand up. <laughs> <laughs> please, yes. So we have Vasya here, we have Paz, we have Nicolas, we have Gula. And Theo is also here. Uh, he also <laughs> worked on Flink, right? So yeah, that would be really hand, hand, come in very handy when we um, do the hands-on later on. So you can also ask, not only us, but also uh, the other Apache Flink committers. Um, yes, um, as I've mentioned, we are working at Data Artisans, and we are fully ded dedicated to developing Apache Flink. So the goal of this talk is really just to get you started using Flink. Um, who of you has already used Flink before? Okay, that's maybe one third. So um, maybe also those people will learn something new today. Um, so. First, we, we'd like to give you an overview of Apache Flink, um, just to let you know like, how it works um, roughly. And then we talk a bit about um, how it works internally. We will give you an idea of the basic uh, APIs, which will help you to, um, you, um, to do the hands-on later on. And then we will do the exercises and um, give, a, give you a demo and show you some advanced features. For the exercises, we have a website, which is here on the board. You, uh, this is the shortened link. Yeah, it's also, or you can use this link here on the, on the, sli on the slides yeah, as well. The slides are available on the webpage and comments, so they can also copy and paste from Right, the slides are also on the webpage, but here you can also find uh, the exercises. The exercises only here, not on the, the... You can find here the slides and the exercises, yeah. and the slides are also on the summer school webpage if you... Yeah, prefer a PDF. Um, right. So, what happened? Uh, what is what is uh, going on with Apache Flink? Because uh, not too long ago, not so many people talked about Apache Flink, and the reason for that is not that it's just it was just created, but it actually um, um, got a lot of attention because. Um, it also it, uh, entered the Apache uh, Software Foundation, and just one year ago, um, it was the core basically hasn't really changed, but it was a much um, smaller project with just the dataset API for for batch processing. And just uh, one year later, we already have um, a dedicated streaming API and a, a bunch of libraries, which we'll talk about later. Um, so. A lot of things happened, um, and that's the result of uh, very hard work of a lot of contributors. And we can see here that it's also reflected in the contribution graph, which is derived from, from the Git repository. Um, the project started very early in uh, 2008, 9, um, and you can see that now we have, uh, now actually uh, today we have over 150 cont contributors already in total. And it's uh, yeah, one of the most uh, active uh, big data projects. Some of you might not really know what Apache is or probably heard it before, but it's a really a uh, kind of philosophy, a uh, kind of way of developing software in an open way. And uh, yeah, some people like to call it the Apache way. Apache, the Apache Software Foundation is really an independent non-profit organization based in the US. And um, it uh, is really, um, the process of Apache is really consensus based and tries to have low hierarchies and tries to communicate every, everything open and public. So um, 
While we are working uh, at Data Artisans uh, on Flink, um, we also try to um, do it the Apache way and communicate openly. And that's also the key to success because we um, get external contributions and um, yeah, that helps to improve Flink. So, because we talked about uh, Hadoop yesterday, we want to uh, give you, before we really start, an idea um, what role Plink, Flink plays in this big data stack, which are mostly Apache project, but not only. So, um, of course, um, here in, in the API side, we, we can integrate Hadoop um, input and output formats, but also um, existing map and reducer functions, we can reuse them, so that's really handy. And for, for concerning data access, of course, we, we rely, uh, we can use HFS, but we, don't, we are not dependent on it, and a bunch of more um, ways to access data in the cloud. And on the deployment side, we, you can also run Apache Flink directly, but also on, to, on, on top of Hadoop Yarn or um, Apache TES or in some other cloud environments. So, having said that, like, what really is Apache Flink? And uh, if you break it down and try to simplify it as much as possible, you could call Apache Flink a stream processor which you, with which you can realize a lot of applications. So, at its heart, we have um, the streaming data flow runtime, which really interprets all the programs you write as a data flow graph and um, runs it in a distributed streaming uh, fashion. Yes. And what can I do with Link apart from, um, apart from this basic concepts which you have, don't have to think about a lot, uh, most of the time? We have very uh, um, convenient APIs and it's, they're all, all based around the basic concept of bootstrapping from a source uh, a data stream or a data set and then applying various operations like a map reduce or a join and um, these lead, lead you to um, data again to a data set or data stream and once you um, output your data to a sync you have a complete flink program so it's basically just three steps and what are um, like very simplified applications that you can realize with, with this data stream or data set API? Well, we, we've seen the MapReduce example, which is here very depicted, very, very simplified, uh, where we, for example, bootstraps a, a triangles data set from, um, from, from a table where we store the base and the height of a triangle and then map them to rectangles, um, sum up all the the areas of the of the rectangles and write out um, the area of the square we get. And on on the streaming side, we have, for example, a live stock feed where we um, get in the current stock prices of um, of stocks like Microsoft, Google, and um, we want to alert, for example if the Microsoft stock increases by a certain threshold, or we want to know about like, what's going on in the stock market, summing up all the stocks every 10 seconds, and also alert if, if it, some threshold exceeded like this. There's some um, basically infinite possibilities, but just to give you a basic idea, I wanted to have these two examples. What is the difference between streaming and batch? Well, very, really simplified, we have, if we have these three categories, input, data transfer, and latency, we have, of course, on the streaming side, possibly infinite input. And um, the data goes through the program in a pipeline way, so there's no materializing of the results between the operators, but the data goes through. And gener generally, it's nice to have a low uh, latency for streaming, I mean, it doesn't have to be low, <laughs> but uh, it should be because you want results fast and uh, uh, you want to ideally run your streaming applications in real time. 
On the batch side, you have a file, for example, in HDFS, it's uh, finite source. And um, in Flink, we can usually, in batch, you execute, execute blocking. But in Flink, we can also um, pipeline um, batch, batch programs. And, but the, the latency you get is usually high because, um, yeah, because you, you have to um, process usually all the data first to, um, to get some result. And the really cool thing about Apache Flink and also other projects is that if you declare your operations, your program, your data, big data program in those APIs or in a library, then you can, because these operations which are supported can be parallelized, you can parallelize your program as well to, um, by setting the, we call it parallelism, to um, basically arbitrary amount of, of machines. And not only that, of course, uh, you can also write very complex programs which um, yeah, have multiple inputs and outputs and um, bootstrap from several sources and go to several things. And this is, for example, a, a real, I mean, it's very blurry, you cannot see anything, but um, this is a real um, job, job graph we, we ran on top of Apache Flink for some, some, of, the, uh, some of our customers which tried out Flink. So if we look at the system, we want to know, like, what's the architecture of system, how, like, how does it um, work internally. And to give you an overview first about the ac architecture, um, I want to show you that it's, it's really simple and it's not so different from, from many other systems. So we have um, the client, which is responsible for submitting programs and writing programs. And then we have the job manager, which is just another name for the master in Flink. And the job manager com um, receives, uh, talks with the client and receives the, the data flow uh, um, graph that we want to execute and talks with the task manager, which are basically the workers, um, and lets them execute the Flink uh, program. So if we look at it a little bit more in detail, um, the client is, is, is responsible for optimization and for deriving the, the, what we call the job graph, which is the data flow, which uh, it's extracted from, the, from, from your program. And yes, passes uh, this to the job manager and retrieves the result. And the job manager is, yeah, as I said, the, the master. It, from, from the job graph, it generates the execution graph, which is basically um, Another graph which contains all the state um, of, an, of, of, a, of an execution of, of your program. And it, Job Manager makes sure that um, it assigns the task to the task managers and um, handles failovers in case the task manager dies and keeps track of the whole execution. The task managers, um, as I mentioned, they receive tasks. I think this is a bit different from uh, what um, tasks are referred to in Hadoop, but tasks are pretty much parallel instances of, of an operation you specified in the API. And these tasks um, run in what we call, so call um, task slots. And uh, yeah, the, well, maybe not entirely intuitive thing in Flink is that several tasks can run in one task slot because we execute Preferably, we execute programs in a pipeline, so in a streaming, streaming way. That means uh, we have to um, make it possible for operators to pass on uh, results directly um, within a task slot to another operator. And yeah, how does this look when, when we put all this together? So we have your program, you write it in your favorite IDE, and then the, 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 the client phase, which we call also call pre-fired phase, it extracts uh, the types, figures out how to efficiently execute your program, checks your data and efficient execution strategy, strategies um, um, and optimizes them, it generates the data flow graph, hands it on to the job manager, the job manager takes care of a whole execution and the scheduling, and the task managers do the actual work. 
Okay, that, that was a, a really rough overview of um, how Flink's architecture looks like. Now um, I want to show you a bit more what happens on the task manager si side, so where the actual computation of the results happen. So I mentioned that a program is basically, so the job, what we call the job graph, is basically um, a, a graph, a direct acyclic graph of operators. And operators in Flink can co compute, but also th they can hold state in the case of streaming. And what happens in this after, after we generate the execution graph at the job manager is that we, um, that we ha um, have a, a, a source here, an operation, and followed after that operation, we always um, result with an intermediate data set, which is really just a logical way it, um, to represent a result of a computation. So we will see what that means later on. But this abstraction is very powerful, and we can realize lots of different uh, behaviors um, at runtime with this abstraction. So um, <laughs> I hope it's not too complicated, but um, I'm going to explain it in detail. So I wanted to show you what, what really happens at runtime when, when we execute um, a job graph, which is turned into an execution graph at the job manager. So as I told you, the job manager is responsible for, the whole, uh, for managing the whole execution. So what it will do first, it will bring up tasks at the task managers. And as I told you, those tasks can be, um, it can be not only, and this is a task slot here, so it cannot only be one task but several, like for instance here a map and a reducer in one task slot. And once it brought up this, uh, these two mappers on two different task managers, the, the mapper will um, report to the job manager when, um, when an intermediate result is available. And the job manager will then proceed and tell the next operator, bring up the next oper operator or tell it to fetch the data. And the operator will get the data from either, um, in this case, locally from this re result partition, that's what we call the, the partial results, or um, via the network, for example. Yes, and Right, right, here, here it goes over the network. Um, and in the case of, for example, a simple map reduce job or a batch job, this, this can be uh, blocking, so we have to materialize the whole result partition first. Or if we have, for example, a streaming job, the execution, we can also do a map reduce job in streaming, the execution looks um, basically the same, but we, we use the pipeline result partition, which means that we um, that immediately once the result partition, uh, once data is available for the result partition, we notify the job manager and the next um, task can consume the results. That lets us um, pipe the data through the system in a streaming way. Um, yeah, and of course you could also do that differently, and there are systems who do it differently. You don't have to have this flexible runtime, streaming runtime. You can just execute, discretize basically with streams into several jobs and execute those and have a blocking result for every job which you hand over to the next job. That's also a way to do it, but in Flink this is supported natively. So we like to think about batch as a special case of streaming. So, and here's a little um, comparison to show you. Um, in batch, we have a finite input file um, in, in streaming infinite. And if you think about this, it's really just um, a generalization streaming. You can, if you can handle infinite streams, you can also um, figure out like, um, when, to, when to stop in case of a finite stream. And in, in stream, we have this uh, concept called windows, which lets you um, basically define a time span or some uh, some number of elements which you, which you like to aggregate first and then perform some computation on. In case of um, batch, this is just a, a global 
window, which is just one window, and in stream we have several. And I mentioned already we have um, pipelined data exchange and streaming. While we have a batch, we can, we can actually use both. Okay, and now that we have um, explained the runtime, um, I want to show you that we can realize very, very different applications on, on top of this runtime. Of course, we can do stream processing, we can ba do batch processing, but we also have, and we will cover that in the advanced section, we also have um, some very efficient ways to run machine learning algorithms at scale. For example, also supporting iterations and delta iterations, which I did not cover here. Um, but it's basically allowing cycles here in the in the in the uh, data flow um, in the data flow graph, and also um, we can very uh, handle very efficiently um, graph analysis. And there, are, um, yeah, these are the main libraries are uh, built on top now, but they're always uh, new coming up. There are definitely more applications that you could do. So now that I did all the talking. Um, you might have got bored and you, you asked yourself, like, so it's interesting, but does it really work? And we wanted to show you that, um, yeah, we can do um, a demo for the streaming case, um, yeah, which demonstrates a nice use case. Yeah, the idea is that Max does a demo now, then he talks about the API for you guys as a preparation for the exercise, and then we have roughly an hour for the hands on session. And then after lunch break, we either continue with the hands-on or with the advanced um, introduction. Do it. So this we can decide on the spot. So what Max is going to do now is he is going to live feed um, Wikipedia edits um, into Flink. So there's this IRC channel. It's called Wikipedia something, where all the edits to Wikipedia are live uh, mirrored. So Max is going to set up um, a system to feed this data into another system called Kafka. And Kafka is basically um, the HDFS of streaming. So we store the live edit somewhere on the system. So it's rather small, by the way. Oh, it's small, yeah. Let me see, I can increase the size. Yes. Yeah. So, um, nice. Yeah, so basically what I did, I started Yarn and Kafka, and um, now um, we uh, read from this IRC channel and parse um, the strings, the JSON strings from IRC channel into Kafka, and we can verify this uh, works by um, reading from the Kafka topic. So we see now we get a bunch of uh, JSON objects, uh, strings, uh, that contain the uh, the channel, which is either actually only Wikipedia or vi the dictionary, and the only the English one, and the user, and some some timestamp and number of lines modif modified. Yeah. So this is not Flink yet. This is just like reading the data in. Yeah, but this confirms we have the data. So we stop uh, consuming from Kafka and switch to my IDE. Yeah, exactly. This is also what we're going to do later on today. So get used to it. Um, so <laughs> this I'm is using IntelliJ, IntelliJ yes. IntelliJ. Yeah. yeah. So and this is a Scala program. It's a Scala program, yes. But it could also be done in Java. And actually, the, the, um, just, just yeah, the API I present later on will be in Java, because I think more people are familiar with that. Um, yeah, and don't get confused. This is more like a preview. Yeah. So yeah. Preview. yeah. So. So um, what what we what do we have here? We have um, we have the what we call the execution environment. In this case, a stream execution environment, which is a kind of context for all of our ex execution, and we also um, bootstrap the source from it. In this case, a uh, Kafka source, which um, reads from this Kafka topic, Wikipedia raw. And once we receive this, um, we receive messages, we apply, which are the strings, we apply a flat map and we have written um, a JSON extractor which converts it, the string, to um, a Java object, which is, uh, which we have here. 
We saw it contains a bunch of fields like it's which I contained there. Oh, it's now it's too small. So like the channel and the time and the user. Okay, we don't have to worry about that. Let's first um, see if that works. So basically we do the same as I just did from the command line. It's too small. Um, Can you make it bigger? I don't know how. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay, but what you see is that in the beginning it was very fast. It was basically catching up with the historic data, processing all the stuff uh, from the time Max started this consumer, and now it actually has caught up with real time, and you see that the uh, processing is slower because oh. data is coming in slower. That's horrible. Oh. Yeah. yeah. How do you increase the size? <laughs> okay. Okay, then, yeah, as a next step, if you're not just interested in the raw data, you would, you would apply some further transformations. For example, can we, can we um, uh. Uh, better. that's better, huh? Uh, yeah, you can see now. Okay, now we cannot see that much, but okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's also not that important, I guess. So let me stop that. And now, whoa. Now we can, um, now we, we have the data, we're read, reading data from Kafka, we can apply some more operations. So for the data now are transformed into certain objects. Or right, these are objects, right, this edit object which was printed there. So, so now you have a stream of edit objects. So right, so I can um, op apply a map operation, for example which is really um, nice in Scala because it has this nice ABI. So I get this edit object and I might want to just, because we have a lot of different um, fields here on this object, like div URL, we're not really interested into that. So we just select the channel, um, the username, and um, print this again. So see how that looks like. So, as expected, now we have only <coughs> channel and the username. And we might now want to count for, for a certain time span how many edits a user makes. So there are actually some some bots out there which automatically process Wikipedia entries, like clean them up and um, do some, for example, for verbs, do some uh, change them, like conjugate them. So, so we might want to count, uh, group um, the these edits uh, every five seconds. And once we have grouped them, we might want to sum up the number of edits. So, and how do you do that in MapReduce? Of course, you have to add some kind of a one here, so you can you can sum it up later on. Um, there's also ways to do it differently, but we do it here like this now. So, which field do I have to sum up? To sum up the the third field, which starts with zero, so it's two here. And yeah, which field? Right, so, yeah, and after that to get the extra objects which are contained in the window, we have to apply the flatten operation. You don't have to worry about that. Um, so now we have to wait five seconds. And we see, for example, that there's this Betty bot that does a lot of edits. You know, maybe it's just spam, I don't know. Um, <laughs> But there are also some maybe normal users who have written some scripts to manipulate Wikipedia. Um, right. So, what I wanted to show you now is that we can actually integrate Flink into a streaming pipeline, which means we, we cannot in only read from um, a source, for example, Kafka, but we can also write back. So. What we, write, what we do now is to, um, of course we could, for example, also apply a filter to filter out only like 
very high number of um, edits. Okay, but to feed this data back is um, we apply another map operation, which actually just converts the whole tuple we uh, this two tuple we have into into a string, and then we write it. We not only print it, but we write it back to a new Kafka sync, new Kafka topic, which we call it Flink output. And if we do that, we still actually we still print here, but we're not interested into that that anymore because. Mm, okay. Because we can now use Kafka to read from this topic. So it's called Flink Output. And we, we, can, we will see that we now used Flink to create a, some kind of streaming pipeline where we receive input and write to an output again. And the idea is that another system might then catch up with this yeah, data. So it's yeah. like it's Doing some data cleaning of a lot of exactly. stream that's coming in and producing another stream that's stored now that people can use it yeah. in a different. So this was a rather process. toy example, of course, but you could also do like more complex mm -hmm. processing at this point. Um, yeah, any question up to this uh, up to this point? Uh, it's a very interesting question, and we get to that in the advanced section actually. Yeah, advanced so section or, in the or exactly, section. or even more in detail on Friday okay. by Paris and Gula. Yeah. That's a very good question. But it, su it supports uh, fault tolerance, so much to say, and uh, exactly one semantics. Right. Is there another question? Or No? OK. OK, then I guess we can con continue with the uh, hands-on part by introducing the API. Um, so also, maybe let's have a look at the website. Yeah. Um, so this is where you get the exercises and also some instructions on how to set up your environment. It's again too small. Again too small. Hmm. So Amir, you have already a virtual machine set up. Can you yes. we, we can uh, just interact and see? Oh, oh. Exactly, you can. So there are two possibilities. So I sent you, uh, actually I put the link to the virtual machine that all the people it's not the word that's what you sent me. Or you can install ah. the packages locally on your machine. So it's up to you. Okay. Yeah, but you have done that already, right? Yeah, we have both options, yeah. <laughs> I mean... I hope you have downloaded them. Uh, I sent you from... I sent you an email before, so you can download it from the... Yeah. Um, okay. If you haven't downloaded, I have on the flash disk, on uh, USB disk, if you want. So you can find the instructions and stuff. Yeah, so um, yeah, this is a general intro. You find the slides also here online and on the uh, summer school page. But there's also this point which explains how you can set up the environment for the hands-on session in half an hour. So it also builds on this uh, virtual image you can use. So I would ask you to um, clone this repository. should work fine from with the internet connection here and import it into uh, the IDE. And to make sure that everything is working, you can run a word count example from the IDE. And yeah, to confirm that <coughs> everything is working as expected. And then afterwards, um, we'll get to the exercise. And the goal is that we do a little bit fancier word count example, which we call ma mail count. Um, but we'll get to that. So if you want, you can also have already have a look while Max introduces mm. the API. Yeah. Okay, for the example, we thought it would be nice to give you only introduction to the Datasep API because yeah, we cannot really cover everything um, today, but streaming is, is covered later. streaming is also covered later on Saturday by Gula and Paris. So yeah, we are now on top of the data flow runtime. We will look at the dataset API. 
the APIs are, for example, here in Scala, are not very different. And what is really different is so the operations are very similar, like a flat map or map or reduce. What, dif what is different is the special streaming semantics, like the, the windowing. Yes, and now um, don't get confused. This is now Java. Uh, looks very, very bulky as always. <laughs> um, but this is the the basic word count in Flink, in the Flink Java API. And I want to show you um, the steps um, how to get um, from bootstrapping your sources to actually running such a program. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Um, so we have at first always the execution environment, um, which which uh, helps you to bootstrap your whole program, and also later on it automatically determines whether you run this locally or in a cluster environment. Then we have what, what we call um, a source. So in this case, uh, a text file, and we result we get a data set which is of type string. In, in Flink, you always specify the, the types. In, in Scala, they actually inferred, but and they're always, um, always there. And that's uh, really nice because we, we can uh, execute optimized um, strategies for dealing with these data types. And also, it, it keeps your uh, program type safe. So once you're in this pre fight phase, which I showed earlier, you will always notice when types don't match and your program is actually not able to execute. So then you apply operations like fragment, group by, and reduce group. We'll go, uh, we'll go over these later. And these can be uh, like user-defined functions, which can be uh, any kind of, like this, in this case, a tokenizer and, and a summation, can be any kind of function. And in the end, you write out your data set to some source, here it is a CSV file. And don't forget to execute because all these operations by default, if they don't require execution, then they will just lazily do nothing until uh, we call execute on the execution environment. So, and yeah, as I said, here are the, the user defined functions. They always implement an interface, like the flat map function. They um, have the input and the output type specified for checking types. And um, yeah, in this case, a flat map which gets an input value and a collector which lets you emit uh, multiple, multiple objects if you want, or just in this case, we emit all the tokens. Yes, and the root deducer is also follows the same logic. Also, we have this, for example, group reduce interface. We, interface. we also have the map, re, uh, the Hadoop map reduce style reduce interface. Um, and we have the types. In this case, we get the whole values as an iterable inside the function, so we can iterate uh, over the whole input and produce the output with a call to the collector. So does that make sense? Do you have any questions? Yes. Sorry. Okay. Uh, what do you want to know about the execution environment? Yeah. Well, as I, yeah, only briefly mentioned is uh, this get execution environment. Um, like you can also explicitly ex um, create a local execution environment or remote execution environment if you want to have control over it. But by default, this return this automatically determines like if you actually now run your program inside in, in the IDE or you submit it to the cluster via the command line interface. So, and yeah, then it executes differently. And uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we we transfer. Yeah, we we have to transfer bytecode. Otherwise, the task uh, we have to get the classes somewhere to the ta somehow to the task manager. Otherwise, they will not find the class. And we have a special what we call uh, the the blob blob cache blob manager with a special um, so sort of uh, way of distributing them. And we could also um, th that way we are also independent of HDFS. We could also put them into HDFS, for example. 
You had a client yeah. submits them to the job manager, and the job manager takes care per job to distribute the jars and cash them. Yeah. So if you reuse jars over multiple jobs, you will, won't have to like redistribute every time. Okay, so a little bit about the concepts after this example. So we have the data types. I already mentioned that we, you can um, use all the kind of primitive or normal data types, types in, in Java, but also arrays, for example. But Flink also has a very um, rich type system, I would say. It also allows um, tuples, uh, arbitrary type, and um, pojos, which are just basically your own Java object, like the edit object we showed in the example. And it, it's able to, via, via Java reflection, able to handle these um, custom data types very efficiently. Yes, so uh, tuples are a very generic, lightweight, and a very uh, well-supported um, data type in Flink. So you have this tuple 1 to 25, um, where you can store like, tuple data uh, of any type. And if you want to get data from a tuple, you you just um, it starts you just select the, the index of the tuple. That's also how I um, sum, summed up the the counts in in the demo we gave in the streaming demo. So it's uh, just you have just have to remember it starts with zero, like uh, like arrays in Java. Then there are basically um, two types of map operations. You know this kind of map operation for MapReduce, where you have an input and output type, and this um, typically uh, matches. And you here, for example, you you emit for every value just emit an output. Um, yeah, for example, we have the one, two, three, four input, and we just multiply it um, by two, and we get this. Uh, 2568 output. And you can also do that with um, what we call a flat map. So, and a flat map um, can rece also receives all the inputs but um, gets a collector which can um, which you can call collect on multiple times. So in this example we just emit uh, uh, the number one time we have get the same result because we call out collect like two times and would uh, output every num every result twice. It's a bit more Flexible. Then, just another um, operation is the filter. Here, for example, you um, you would uh, uh, implement filter function only gets an input and returns true if you want to want to keep the value, and if you return false, like if it's a three here, three here, um, then um, you filter out this number. So. Um, Three wouldn't be uh, unequal to three, and so um, we have filtered out the three in the results. Then we have um, groupings. So sometimes, a lot of times, we want to split, like in a word count example, um, our data set into, into groups, like based on um, identical keys. So if we, for example, have um, in as input a table of uh, name names um, and ages of persons, um, you could group on the on the on the age, for example. If you want to know how many people are contained in in, a, in an age group, and then reduce these um, reduce these groups by summing up all the counts uh, of the people that are in the same group. So you would see that, yeah, it's obvious that there are two people who are 18 years old and and so on. And here's the, for example, group reduce function for this example. Basically, um, you go over all the, the people who are in the same group and you store the age group and um, increase the count every time you, you see um, a person and then emits the result. Yes, um, so far um, this um, can be also expressed in, in MapReduce very easily. Um, but we also have more complex operations with two, uh, for example, with two inputs. So typically, um, if we have a lot of data, data, we want to perform join 
joint two types of tables like in a, like in a normal database system. So here in this example, for example, for this, uh, we have the like a typical block application um, where we have authors and authors write posts and we link authors and posts by um, assigning uh, the author ID to every post. So we have these two data sets and we want to join them in Flink. So what we do is uh, we do authors join posts and we specify the join key on the left side and uh, on the right side. So we would specify zero here because ID is the first field and um, two on the right side because author ID is the third field here. And what we then get is a, basically a new data set which contains the results of both data sets um, where they were, um, where the keys uh, matched. So, yeah, uh, we can see here Julia, Julia's post and Romeo's post. And this is a bit uh, bulky because you actually get a tuple two which contains um, the both, uh, both types of the, the input data sets. But you can also, for, you can also use um, uh, a join function, which you uh, apply using this with um, syntax. And this join function, you could, for example, specify that you receive the two inputs, um, but you want to only keep the name and the name of the author and the title of the post he or she wrote. Okay, so now that we got started with some basic operations. Um, I told you already that we can we can specify sources and sinks, and there you can not only read from a text file but also from a CSV file, and you have this really nice uh, way of debugging your applications by reading from a source from a collection, which is a basic Java collection like an like an array list, um, and create your dataset from this, and also just specify objects with the from from elements uh, method. Yes, and the, the path to, for example, text file could also be um, an HDFS um, path, so we support different um, ways of accessing files and it's automatically handled. Mm, yeah, just a little example again, not, not too uh, exciting. So here we just, ex get, um, just put, put some strings and bootstrap a data set. Here we use an array list, um, which we put in here. It's fairly easy, I think. And yeah, from a file also, we have had this in the word code example, but you can also read, for example, from CSV file. There you, of course, have to specify the, 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 um, the types of your input data, otherwise Flink doesn't know how to, um, it's just text and Flink doesn't know how to handle it. And you, you can also specify to include or exclude fields. We are a bit masked. Basically, one is where we include a field, a column, and zero is where we don't. And similar for the for the sinks, we have um, we have a writer's text or formatted text and writer's CSV. But we also have these special uh, methods, which in some algorithms and also for debugging are really useful. So, um, as I mentioned, usually operations or sinks are uh, lazy in, in Flink, so they are not executed unless you, we call, um, execute on the environment. So all these, um, right, uh, well, we, if you just specify this, it will do nothing. You'd have to do an execute. But then there are the, the eager ones, we call them eager, um, which when you call print, actually, it executes and prints the results to for example, in your IDE, or you can um, use collect to return the actual data set. Usually it's just, the data set is just abstract um, concept, con concept. You can actually get it back. And you can also count the number of elements in the data set. Of course, you have to keep in mind that um, this is not always a good idea because um, if you want to return a data set, you have to materialize and get it to the client, and uh, if it's a big data set, this can take a while. It's not 
efficient in all cases. But if you have like a small model which you need to transfer back to the client and then submit again, then in, for example, machine learning algorithm, this is very useful. Yes, then underneath the API and uh, the data for runtime, we have different ways of executing Flink program. Um, there's this local execution mode, which is automatically run if you use this execution environment, get execution environment, which um, starts really um, all the process that would also run in a normal Flink cluster, but just inside one VM. And of course, it's not exactly like a real cluster, but um, pretty close. So um, if your program runs there, it's uh, very likely it will also run in a distributed fashion. And we have, of course, the remote execution where the client submits the job to, to a cluster and yeah, gets result, the results back. Yeah, if, um, if you don't want to run a dedicated Flink cluster, and because you, you have multiple users, you want to configure, um, you want to authenticate user, you want to share resource, res resources in a, in a fair way, you, you would need to use um, Yarn. Because Flink, uh, I mean, it's not concerned too much with that because, yeah, other people solve these problems and it's not so easy actually. Um, so basically, um, you have a way f of to tell the client to use uh, to give um, it, it a Yarn resource manager address, and um, the resource manager in Yarn will will allocate uh, containers which are um, supervised by a node manager and run, for example, the job manager, task managers there. And um, that makes it possible to also uh, run it um, together with other applications which are supported by Yarn. Yes, and now I hope all of you are ready. Now we will go. We will proceed to do the exercises. Any questions at this point? Sorry? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we did that yes. in the streaming example actually in the end. Uh, maybe it, it was a bit quick, but uh, yeah, we, we read from Kafka and then wrote back to Kafka again into a different topic. And then, of course, another Flink program could just read from this topic and process it further. Yeah. Uh, I installed the latest version of the Flink. If they follow the instructions on, the, on this website here, yeah. uh, it shouldn't be a problem. Okay. I mean, there are instructions on this website. If you follow them, uh, the setup should work. Um, but we will, we will also be like walking around and helping you guys. Um, yeah, so just do this, please. So maybe just, just to mention one mm. thing. I mean, this example that you have seen now, it was written in Java. There is also equivalent in Scala for people. And also this coming Python, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just to make, I think it is not yet uh, out, but soon, is it? Python API is already out, but it's only supported for the data set API. Yeah, that's that's the data set. Okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's okay. Definitely, yeah. yeah. Just browse around, look at the exercises here from overview, and everything should be covered. But we'll also like walk around now and um, help you guys if t something comes up. So we, it's now almost 12 o'clock. So we have roughly an hour left before lunch. Yeah, I think lunch is 12.30. 12.30. Yeah. So we have an hour. Yeah, just get going now, and then we see how we continue after lunch. Okay? Perfect. Mm -mm.